All right. Well, welcome to the, I think, first ever um, Acapella Science podcast. I'm not sure if this is going to have another title, maybe Science Life or something like that. Um, in any case, with me today, we're out in UBC, and this is Professor Jamie Matthews. Um, professor here, exoplaneteer, astrophysicist. Rocket scientist. Rocket scientist. Clearly loud individual. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Fashion for, plate. Thanks for having me out. Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah, so uh, you seem to be a little bit of a... Yeah, you're, you're an extrovert. A little, yeah. It seems that you can... You, I mean, you have a lot of stories about <laughs> conning your way into various <laughs> things. You're a charming guy. Thank you. Um, Nothing can be proven in court, though. Well... We'll, we'll see about okay. that. Don't, don't say anything on record. Okay. Why, why space? Like of all the things you could do, because I imagine you could do pretty much whatever you want. Yeah. I, I don't have one of those inspiring stories of like, you know, my, my father taking me out to look at the Perseid meteor shower, or my mother reading from the big book of space. Uh, but my earliest memories are of the stars. Like at age two, I was curious about the stars. And I've wanted to be who and what I am before I even understood what it meant to be who and what I am. My, my parents, I'm an only child from a poor family, Chatham, Ontario, uh, Canada, and neither of them went past elementary school education. My father worked on an assembly line in a truck plant, was an international harvester for like 40 years. I worked on that assembly line to, uh, to make money to afford to go to the University of Toronto as an undergraduate student. Mm. And, uh, you know, and so they had no idea uh, about the science that I was interested in, but they knew that I wanted to go beyond what they had accomplished and they supported me in every way that they could. Uh, but it's been very linear in the sense that I'm living my dream. This is what I've wanted to do from my earliest memory. And the, if it were a, a Hollywood screenplay, the, the real tension in it was would I get to fulfill my dream right. because not everybody gets to be uh, a professional astrophysicist. Uh, and certainly there were times when it looked like that might not happen. Uh, for students here at UBC, I'm an undergraduate advisor, and for students who are feeling kind of discouraged, I go to the filing cabinet over there and I pull out my first year transcripts at the University of Toronto and show them how badly I did in my first year uh, because I was one of those you know, brilliant students in high school that never had to work at anything, got A pluses all the time and then arrived at university and found that, wow, I actually had to work and things got hard and I started getting C's and D's. And, you know, but at the same time, I'd also discovered that I could be somebody different than the kind of image that, that people had of me in my hometown as the uber uh, junior egghead, uh, you know, astro nerd. And so, uh, you know, within a year of being in Toronto, I was a DJ, I was a dancing bartender, at a, it was called Roscoe's, I was involved in student politics, uh, you know, I had uh, created an alter ego named Dr. Libido, uh, which is still my, my uh, uh, Skype uh, uh, ID. And, and so that's part of the reason why my transcripts in first year were maybe a little bit subpar, but I can you know, tell people, students who have that dream, that even if you have some bumps along the way, that it can work. You know, here I am, I'm a full professor, I'm an officer of the Order of Canada, probably wow. a, a clerical error in the part of the Governor General, Michael Jean at the time, but I was too polite to correct it. There's likely some worthy Canadian named Janie Matthews who got screwed out of the honor that she rightfully deserved, but hey, you know, that's just the way it rolls. That's really cool. That's something that, like, I always tell people when they ask me sort of how, how I ended up, like, or why should you do some crazy art thing on top of doing physics, is that I don't think that you can live your life just being in this, in this box as, like, the egghead or yeah. the artist or the musician yeah. or whatever. Like, you're too big for that, and you can't focus on one thing That's for that right. long. And, I mean, a lot of the things that I have accomplished in terms of research and education and outreach would have never happened had I not broadened my horizons 
uh, you know, at, at, at a young age. And so, yeah, had I just concentrated on academia, I likely would have gotten, you know, higher grades and I might have, uh, you know, had an easier time of it in the early going, being accepted into graduate school and so on. But the end result, uh, I mean, much of, of who I am and what I've accomplished today is a, a result of, of uh, being able to experience life you know, to the fullest uh, as a student. And I must have learned something because I ma made it here. But I, people ask, you know, you've probably been asked this question, but you know, maybe me because I've been around a little bit longer. You know, if you could go back in time and have a redo, you know, would you do it? And I would say no, because it's hard for me to believe that things could work out much better than they have. I mean, there are lots more scenarios in which things would be a lot worse, and only a small number of them. If you're going to the, like the temporal version of Las Vegas and playing at the roulette wheel, or uh, that you know most of the spots in the roulette wheel are going to be, you know, less favorable than what's happened in my life, and only a few might be better. And and who defines better? You know, I mean, right. uh, so I would not change a thing. Uh, yeah, you might not be in the best possible world, but you're certainly somewhere in the top of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a, a, a science fiction novel that was just uh, you know, published recently by a Toronto writer uh, who deals with time travel, but in the sense of usually our time travel stories are that uh, you know we accidentally you know, slip into a parallel universe where things are worse off than they are here, where you know, the Nazis won World War II or things like that. Uh, but it's usually we go, this is the optimum choice, and we go to something worse. But in this novel, uh, it's basically uh, somebody from another parallel universe, uh, which is the Jetsons version you know, of, the, of the future, the 1950s version of what 2017 would be, uh, and then ends up in our 2017. And it's not all that attractive to somebody who comes from this idealistic uh, version of the future that we uh, used to you know, see in science fiction and the cover of popular science. And so it is kind of an interesting perspective in the sense that, uh, uh, yeah, maybe there are you know, better versions on, you know, in terms of lots of things that could be improved uh, in, in our life and our society. But again, there are lots of worse things. And, and it's if you change one thing, that's one thing being involved in, in uh, you know, space astronomy and you know, having led uh, you know, Canada's first space telescope mission and others, when you're building and designing a space uh, telescope or a satellite, you reach a point after what's called the critical design review where if you change something, you have to you change it only because something's failed in the testing. Because even if you come up with the idea, and scientists always have these kinds of ideas, you know, if you move this uh, little uh, optical element by a millimeter, that will open up this other possibility. Except you move that thing by a millimeter and the ripple effect goes through the whole design and now everything becomes unreliable and you create all sorts of other problems. And so at some point you just have to say, even though I've got a lot of good ideas, I'm gonna have to save that for the Mark II version because you have to stick with what you've uh, you know, designed and what you've tested and what you're confident will work. Uh, and that can be very challenging for scientists because we're always looking for possibilities. Uh, and the engineers, aerospace engineers, I think in many projects have been frustrated with the, the astronomers they've worked with and because the astronomers are constantly coming up and saying, you know, if you just tweak that a little bit, uh, then maybe that's why they liked me because I was pragmatic enough to know once we locked in, we had to stay by, by the rules. And hey, it worked, Canada's first space telescope, officially called MOST for microvariability and oscillation of stars. Microvariability et oscillation stellaire, you were in Montreal. It's nice and bilingual. <laughs> exactly, that's why I chose it. Probably why we were funded by the federal government. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, so its official name is MOST. Its nickname is the Humble Space Telescope. Uh, but it was meant to be a one-year mission to observe 10 stars and it will be approaching its uh, 14th birthday in space, the day before Canada Day this uh, summer, with about 5,000 stars under its belt. So obviously you know, we, we, we did a few things right with that oh. one. And most, most was sort of your brainchild, was it? Was it were you the, the initiator of this project? Well, it, 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 the gestation was complicated in the sense that I had spent a lot of my career trying to 
detect the, listen to the humming and the music of stars. Our sun is humming in tens of millions of, of frequencies without instruments, so it's a cappella. Uh, not very melodic, uh, although I suspect that Drake could sample it and make a you know, million dollars at least. Uh, but but it's, it's very quiet humming, and obviously the sounds of, uh, uh, of this humming can't be transmitted across the vacuum of space, but we can see the oscillations in the star and the changes in its brightness in the case of the sun, and we can see the wave patterns in the sun and translate them into the frequencies, the pitches of the sounds uh, at which uh, the, the sun is humming. And we're not doing it as music fans listening in, we're doing it because the humming is due to sound waves bouncing around inside the sun and it actually tells us what the sun is like inside in the same way as earthquake vibrations tell us what the earth is like inside. Center of the earth is like 6,400 kilometers beneath our feet. Might as well be 6,400 million light years for all of our ability to go there, but we know what it's like thanks to the techniques of geoseismology. And so we astronomers basically stole pages from the geoseismologist notebook and created a parallel field of asteroseismology, stellar seismology. But the vibrations are so subtle that uh, you know, we could detect them in the sun, but we weren't able to detect them in any sun-like star beyond the sun. And I had spent decades in some of the best observing sites on the planet, some of the best places to observe beyond the planet, the summit of Mauna Kea and the, the big island of Hawaii, uh, the Atacama Desert uh, in Chile, trying to pick up these signals and without success. And we eventually realized that you had to go into space. Uh, and there were projects, uh, you know, the, the, the Europeans and then eventually the Americans uh, projects underway. Uh, and Canada would have been a re relatively small player. And I thought our only way of having access to this technique and to the data would be to be a minor partner in one of these big projects. And then what happened was a, a Canadian aerospace company, a little st startup, an offshoot from the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies, the company was called Dynacon at the time, uh, had developed a, a, an idea of how to stabilize a microsatellite. Now, a microsatellite is a satellite which is less than 100 kilos in mass, and you could fit in a box one meter on a side. And the problem with a microsatellite that size is that it, it's not very stable. It doesn't have a lot of inertia. And so it's easy uh, to make, to have drift even in space. And so if you want to put a camera or a telescope on, on a microsatellite, uh, the pointing would be really bad. The blurring, uh, the best pointing that had ever been achieved for a satellite in that class was about one or two degrees. Now the, you know, you, you hold your pinky finger up at arm's length and make sure which finger, finger you hold up so I'm not offending anybody. <laughs> That's the, the width of your pinky finger and your vision at arm's length is about a degree. So imagine that everything you could see was blurred by twice the width of your pinky fingernail at arm's length. That was what was possible with microsats. Dynacon had an idea of how they could improve that by several orders of magnitude, and they wanted a demonstration project. And it turns out that for this stellar seismology, didn't necessarily need a big telescope, a big light bucket. You didn't need the perfect pointing. You didn't need Hubble Space Telescope sharpness of images. And this was just a perfect match. And so we uh, the, submitted a proposal. We've got to give the Canadian Space Agency credit. We don't often give Canadian federal government agencies credit for vision. But in this case, they had a vision of what, where uh, could Canada go in space? What niche could Canada fill with our resources that no other country was doing? And science with microsats was such a niche. And uh, we submitted a proposal one of 50, the only astronomy proposal, we were the dark horse, and we were selected for what's called a phase A competition, and then won that competition, and ended up, even though our proposal was uh, submitted in, what, 1997, and uh, the European proposal for a similar mission went forward at least about 10 years before that. We actually beat them into space by three and a half years, and then beat the American Kepler mission into space by about six years. Now, it's not an us versus them. 
I'm in the executive council for Kepler. I'm a co-investigator on the French Corot mission. But I have to admit that at this point in 2017, after a launch in 2003, the Corot mission, unfortunately, the satellite failed in November of 2012, and Kepler had to end its original planet hunting mission uh, due to a pointing system failure, this kind of technology, in May of uh, 2013. I could have never imagined that I'd be talking about Canada's uh, you know, first space telescope still operating after these other larger, more ambitious and more expensive missions had, uh, had to end. Uh, and so and I am kind of uh, proud of that. <laughs> so what, what have you actually found with, with most? Like how, how do stars evolve? Basically? Well, <laughs> the first result with most was very controversial. Our first primary science target was one of the most familiar stars in the sky to astronomers, uh, Procyon. Uh, and it's like the fourth brightest sun-like star in the sky and had been extensively studied, observationally and theoretically, and we chose it because every indication was that this star was pulsating and vibrating and that we would detect the same kind of humming in it that we know happens in the sun. And so we observed it for a month and we saw nothing. I called it a flat liner. It was as if a patient had gone into a doctor's office for a checkup and the patient looked perfectly healthy and everything was fine except when the doctor used the stethoscope to get a, 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 the heartbeat, there was no heartbeat. And then you know, took the thumb at the pulse and there was still no pulse. And that was what this was like, is that you know, it just was hard to understand. And at the time, you know, the astronomical community, the people who had dedicated um, you know, a large portion of their lives and their careers to studying the star, were extremely skeptical that we were right. They felt that there was probably some defect in the, in the most detector or in our analysis of the measurements. We published the result in a very prestigious journal, Nature, uh, but uh, for the uh, months and even years after that, at, at certain conferences, I might as well have had a bullseye on my chest. <laughs> you know, like, you, you know how people reacted when we nasty astronomers uh, downsized Pluto to the status of a dwarf planet? Well, that was that kind of reaction, except amongst other stellar astrophysicists. I'm still getting YouTube comments about that. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I hadn't realized that people were so attached to uh, to Procyon. Uh, and I think, you know, and if you think about it, of course, the reason people are attached to Pluto was just that everyone had to grow up memorizing the names of nine planets in order. I think it wasn't like it was a warm, fuzzy feeling about Pluto. Uh, they just had that memory and, and didn't want to take away all of that time they spent memorizing the names of the planets. Well, Disney also had a part in turning that into a particularly yeah. lovable dog. Sure, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So the, the Procyon result, uh, you know, it was an example, and I, and I tell this to uh, uh, you know, young scientists and students today, that a, a null result, uh, you know, not detecting something where you're expecting to see something can be just as important. And as it turns out, that it uh, inspired uh, theorists uh, to do three-dimensional models of the atmospheric processes, the turbulence in the atmosphere of this star that we thought we understood, because it's not all that different from our sun, and we th think we understand the sun. Uh, and it turns out that it, stars like this, not very different from the sun, behave very differently than when we thought. And, and so this null result, in some sense, helped rewrite the textbooks on some fundamental aspects of, of, of stellar structure and stellar atmospheres. And, and now everybody has come under the same tent and that uh, you know, our results are consistent with other, what other people have measured and, and the, uh, the theory and the models. Uh, but it was, you know, science is an objective process, but scientists are subjective human beings. And sometimes we have to be dragged kicking and screaming uh, towards, you know, some kind of objective reality by the evidence. And, and this was one of those processes where it took several years. But again, science worked the way it was supposed to, despite, uh, you know, despite the fact that, you know, we scientists have our human biases and fads and trends and emotions that the, the evidence eventually led us to a better understanding of stars. And, uh, and that turned out to be ultimately more exciting and more important than had we seen what we ex were expecting. Uh, 